Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is the 102-year-old Dr. Gladys McGarry, and she's going to be revealing the six secrets to health and happiness in every age. Please welcome her to the show. You are the uh, uh, oldest person I've ever had on the show, so you have that honor. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. You know, I didn't know about you until somebody mentioned, because I, I, like I mentioned to you before we logged on, that I had interviewed a hundred year old male doctor. And then somebody told me about you and I watched everything I could that you have done on YouTube and on podcasts. And I bought your book, which we'll be discussing. So I'm curious, where have you been for the last 102 years? Because it seems like we're only finding out about you now. Oh, I've been all around. <laughs> we say that she's an overnight sensation and it only took her 102 years. <laughs> I think I think that's absolutely fantastic. I'm curious when you're going to be 103 because you're so popular. I think I need to book you right now for that show that you can celebrate when yeah, you're 103. I'll be 103. I'm 102 and three quarters, okay? Are you able to tell us your birthday? November 30th. November 30th. Okay. After, after, after Thanksgiving, well, maybe if you're available that day or close to it, we can do another show because I'm sure people are very, very interested in, in what they can learn from you. Doc, Dr. Gladys, what question do you get asked the most? Oh my, I get many questions, but usually some question like, how come, <laughs> you know, how come something or other how, how did you something or other or something else? You know, it's just all over the place because, yeah. you know, in, in 102 years, you've done a bunch of things. And so <laughs> yeah. people are interested. They really are. You know, you're not just a mother of six. You're a grandmother. You're a great grandmother. You're a great, great grandmother. That's a that's an accomplishment in itself. How many offspring a, do you have? Tribe. <laughs> yeah. How many do I have the total? You guys figure it out. Well, I've got two of my sons here. They may be able to figure it out. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that when I was listening to your book and also some of the podcasts, you talk about having a 10 year plan, which means you're going to be around till 112. Well, it could happen. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have longevity in your family, like in your parents or your siblings? Well, they've all lived into their 90s, pretty much. I had a sister-in-law that lived to be 100, but otherwise, they're all in their mid to eight to late 90s. Yeah. <clears throat> did, did you plan on living this long? I just planned on living. I, I didn't figure out how long it was going to be. As long as I had work to do, I had to keep going. Yeah. I think that's important because people that I've talked to, they seem to have a purpose or a mission. Oh, absolutely. And what is yours? Well, my, you know, the 10 secrets. I mean, the six secrets. The first one is having a mission, having a reason for being here. And my reason has been to get, help people live healthy lives, I guess you might say. but. Um, I don't know. It's been a growing process. It hasn't stopped. <clears throat> and that's kind of important. You know, I had a, a mission at one point, but I've always known that I was going to be a doctor. So that wasn't an issue. But uh, as we went through the years, it grew into different things from my dolls that we got in the hospital and that had to be taken care of. So my sister wouldn't let me play with hers so because they'd get oh, sick and let that happen <laughs> but so it, it's been right from the start I've had something that I've had to do that had to do with healing did you always want to be a doctor well since I was two years old and I told my parents that I was one <laughs> <laughs> oh, so tell me about your 10-year plan how often do you update it by the way well, it's kind of daily or so, something because it's a growing process. <clears throat> it's not something that has, you know, here's the thing. 
in order to have a 10 year plan, I have to femifest it. And let me tell you about femifesting, please. Can I? Oh, please. All right. Um, about oh, 10 years ago, I see, I work with my dreams a lot. So 10 years ago, I woke up one morning and I was a huge crash that woke me up. And when I was in the dream and out of the dream, that state, I realized that I was in a valley in the high Himalayas and I was watching. There was a young woman on the right hand side of the valley who was splayed out on the ground, just barely breathing. And on the left hand side of the valley, there was a big man dressed in armor and he was in the same position, just barely breathing and the words came these two forces of nature have been fighting each other like this their fists going coming together like this and it's time they stopped doing that and put their fingers together so that they were working together and then I woke up and so I had this friend that I was talking to about um, well, I called her about my dream because it was it seemed so vital, and she said, "Well, you know, I've been working with something. The word manifest is really important, and we're all thinking about manifesting. But I, she says, I think it's time we started talking about femifesting. She said, manifesting is like a Jacob's ladder." You manifest, uh, you get a degree, you get your office, you manifest something. Femifest is like a spiral. It goes around and around so that you can be on the fifth rung of the spiral and look down and see what's going on at the second rung and know what's going on. So she says, I think what you're talking about is these two aspects of our humanity the manifestation and the femifestation. Well, as I was looking at my dream, I realized that the feminine, the, the woman was on the right-hand side and that's the masculine side. And the man was on the left-hand side and that's the feminine side. So basically just from the structure of the dream, we were talking about the horribly mixed up trend, uh, trend, not, no, no, a process that we have been going through for eons of women trying to be more um, manifesting and men trying to be, trying to figure out what in the sad patch we're doing, you know, because it was, you know, it's the, this inner work that the feminine really knows how to do, you know, we can be in the kitchen holding one baby in one arm and have two playing on the floor and know what's going on the whole time. It's it's something that, that is real to, to the feminine nature. And we've been really down, I think, downplaying that and kind of, and, and actually the world has tried to do that for how many eons have we been and the kind of and you know, and actually the world was trying to put into positions where only our eyes were showing when when they when they did that to us at covid for covid the men had to do it too and they sure didn't like it but we'd been doing that to women for eons in other words we have continually through years and years and years done things that have made us really so that we don't know who we are. And so in the process of trying to find out how we've been trying to figure out how we can manifest, well, it's time to figure out how the two of these go together and work together. That is not one better than the other. We can't live without each other. When you think about it, a pregnancy is a feminine femifestation. When a woman is pregnant, she and that baby are one unit. They're not two units. 
Everything she eats, the baby eats. Everything she think, thinks, the baby thinks. The baby is growing within her manifestation and can't do anything really outside of that <clears throat> until he takes his first breath. That first breath is his manifestation. So it's this reality of the importance of having the, the feminine growth aspect that is being growing all the time, manifesting when it takes its first breath. It's trying to get ourselves in position of who we are, what we are. Wow. Thank you. You know, you said you wanted to be a doctor since you were two, but there weren't a lot of female doctors back then. Mm -mm. So what, what year did you go to medical school and were you one of the only ones? No. I went to women's medical college in Philadelphia, the only med women's medical college in the country. And I started in, uh, in, September of 1941, the war started in December. So I went to medical school throughout World War II. And everything that we were taught had to be de deal with, with within the frame of medicine, getting rid of <clears throat> diseases and killing pain. So you know, it, it, it was, that's what the world was working with. And so my training was wonderful, but the focus was on how we women could be tougher than the guys. <clears throat> and um, we started with 50 women in my class and only 25 of us graduated because they just, uh, the, 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 the intent was that we be so tough and, and really we, we had to ignore how we were being treated because if we paid much attention to it, we wouldn't have lasted uh, any through it. That's, that's just, you, you seem like a pioneer in so many ways. You started the Holistic Medical Association. When was that and what prompted you to do that? Well, see, my parents were both doctors. My mother was a, got her osteopathic degree in, in 1911. No, no, my father did, my, she in 1913. So she was really a pioneer. But my parents went to India as mission, medical missionaries. And that's where, I, where my childhood started I she went into labor with me at the Taj Mahal <laughs> I think she was kind of a drama queen or something but it was her uh, her influence I think that really um I I I think I burst it I think I came into it knowing that I was going to be a doctor I mean it wasn't any question about whether or anything, I knew I was a doctor when I was two, and I let them know that I was. When you were a doctor, because my, my, my grandfather graduated medical school, I believe it was like 1920, and back then they didn't have all the specialties that they have now, you know, cardiology and nephrology. So were, were most of the doctors at that time more like general practitioners? Yeah, the, not, not the ones that were in the hospital, although most of the general practitioners had patients in the hospital. So yes, when we started our practice, we were GPs and <clears throat> um, it was the expected thing that you did hospital work, but you did ER work and all of that too, as a GP. How can patients play a more active role in their healing? Oh, thank you for that question. <laughs> My oldest son, is a retired orthopedic surgeon. And when he came through Phoenix, he, on his way down to Del Rio, Texas to start his practice, he, 
we were talking and he says, mom, you know, I'm real scared. He said, I have all this training and everything. I'm going into the world. I'm going to have people's lives in my hands. He said, I don't know that I can handle that. And I said, well, Carl, if you think you're the one that does the healing, you have a right to be scared. But your job is to do the job that you've been trained to do, which is amazing. If we have something that is out of kilter and we, an orthopedic surgeon is recommended, we better pay attention to that because that work is huge. It's really important. But when you have done your work as an orthopedic surgeon, you then look to the patient who has within themselves, the physician within them, who now does the healing. Because unless they take over the job and continue to work with what you've given them to work with, it doesn't matter to a hill of beans. That's amazing. You know, you talked about finding your purpose. Are you familiar with the blue zones? Yeah. Yeah where people tend to be longer live, yes. many centenarians, yes. they talk, they call it the ikigai. You know, they, in French, they say raison d'être. What if somebody doesn't know what theirs is? They haven't been looking. <laughs> if you're looking, you'll find it. The thing is, we, people, we haven't told people to look. We've told them, you know, to sort of fit in and try to do what you fit. But if you, if you want to fit in, I think one of the things to do is to look at the world as a huge jigsaw puzzle with each one of us, one of the pieces in that jigsaw puzzle. No one else can fit that piece. I mean, I tried working with jigsaw puzzle and tried to pound a piece in. They don't work. You can't get them in. You just have to fit in. You have to find your own place in this in this universe at this time. And <clears throat> it's called life. And life is constantly moving. It has to move in order to stay alive. If it gets stuck, it gets it dies. So life and love are one. They move together. They have to be together like a pregnancy. It's a moving process. <clears throat> Yeah. So we have a live viewer named Alicia who asks a question. What does the doctor wish was more common knowledge in regards to health? That love is the great healer. Mm, I've heard you say that. Yeah. It's self-love too. Cause people, I had actually, somebody wrote in a question for you and wanting to know how they can learn to love themselves. First of all, think about it. <laughs> Think about who you are and think about amazing things that the very fact that you're asking that question or that you're alive and the awe with which that allows us to look at ourselves. I mean, truly, when you think about yourself, really think about yourself and really think about who you are. And what you really love to do or, you know, get, get involved with who you are, not try to be somebody else. You can't anyway, so don't try it. So try, find out who it is that you are and then come the best of that that you can be. And I'm telling you, it never gets tiresome because every every time you do something, it stretches you to the next place. That, it's a growing process, and that's what life and love is. See, I have these um, five L's that I think, well, years and years ago, I was trying to find some kind of a platform that I could have, have a sort of a foundation, and I came up with these five L's. The first two are life and love. Life by itself can't do anything it's like the little seed in the pyramid, 5,000 years it's been sitting in that pyramid and it's just been sitting there until love 
in the form of light and water and, and carry came to it, loosened its shell and light, which was there all the time, the, all the energy of the universe was in that shell. But as soon as it opened up, then it could begin to grow. But it couldn't do anything like a pregnancy. The baby is growing all the time in there, but it can't actually manifest itself until it takes its first breath. It's that ability of the, of the two aspects of ourselves working together. So life and love are, a, are one unit. The next L is laughter because life without love can't manifest, okay? Next one is la laughter. Laughter without love is cruel. It's mean. It tears families apart. It causes wars to, you know, it's just, just, just downright mean. But laughter with love is joy and happiness. The fourth one is labor. Labor without love is drudgery. Oh, man, I got to go to work. Uh, too many diapers. Life's tough. Every day's hard. All of this kind of thing, you're just dragging yourself through life. But laughter with love, I mean, labor with love is bliss. It's why you do what you do. It's why I do what I do. Why the singer sing, why the painter paints. It's that it's when we find what it is that we really, really came here to do, it becomes just bliss. It, it, uh, you know, it's just that, that's what it is. And the fifth L, that, that, that's duty. That's what, where you drag yourself through it. The fifth L is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. It's like the, the doctor that tells you you should do something and you didn't, you either didn't, couldn't, you know, you didn't do it or somebody, it, it, it's not just turning things off. There are times when you have to do that. But when you, <clears throat> when you really listen, you get understanding. Listening with love is understanding. So these five L's, uh, have been kind of a platform or a foundation for me to work with in putting life into context with other things. Well, I love to laugh. I'm actually, believe it or not, I do stand up comedy. I'm, I'm actually performing in a show tonight, and that is my favorite thing. You know, the person that asked the question on how you learn to love yourself, her name is Debbie, and she said, Please give Dr. Gladys so much love. I honor and respect her so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. She knows who you are. You know, you coined the term holistic, didn't you, when you founded the Holistic Medical Association? Yes. How did how did you come up with that word? It's it's very common now, but back then I'm sure it well, didn't exist. Well, the funny thing was that when we first started it, um the word that we were looking for, it took us two years to figure out which one what it was, because the word we were looking for was the basis of it was, uh, what is healing it? holy? He, see, healing holy health. Those, so it had to start with an H. So the, the WH was not the word that we were looking for. It was the word holistic spelled with an H. But it, it took us two years to come up with that because that's basically the element that we were missing in our in the practice of medicine. We were taught as in, in the hospitals and people what medicine was using was the two basic ones that had to do with body and mind, but the spirit had not been put into it at all. And the way I had grown up working with my parents with medicine and understanding what I saw healing happen I knew that there was something missing. And so when we started the American Holistic Medical Association in the early, late 60s and early 70s, that's what we were looking for. And there were people all around the country 
who were um, physicians who were uh, looking for that also. And my husband at the time <clears throat> was writing a newsletter called Pathways to Health. And it people and physicians uh, uh, got supplements, you know, uh, they got the news, mon newsletter monthly. <clears throat> and this one time in, it must have been about 70, uh, just about 70, maybe a little earlier, one of the, we got a letter back from somebody, a, a mailman in Maine, who was saying that he had gotten our newsletter and he'd been a mailman for years, but three months earlier, he hurt his ankle and nobody could figure out what was wrong with it. He'd gone to doctor after doctor he couldn't do his bail route because he couldn't walk it. And it was just too much. So what, he had just gotten the newsletter that we had written. And we were talking about clearing up a sore throat with um, a castor oil pack. He put a castor oil pack on his neck because he had a sore throat. And his ankle cleared up. And he said to us, if you can figure out why my ankle cleared up, I would be very happy. And we looked at each other and we said, we don't have a clue. So we sent a let the next letter that went out, told the mailman's story. And um, we added a question. If anybody knows why, why this happened, please let us know. And we got a, a answer from a doctor in Italy who said, if you guys knew anything about acupuncture, you would know that the acupuncture, that meridian starts at the end of the nose, goes all the way down that neck and down the, to the toe. So of course, when it removes a block in the neck, it took up care of the block in the thing. And, and we looked at each other and we said, what's this acupuncture stuff? So then we began writing. Felix Mann had written five books in London about acupuncture. There were people in Germany who were talking about acupuncture in Italy and China and Japan, all over the place. But we hadn't heard anything about it here in the States. But so we began getting answers and so on. And we had the first acupuncture symposium at Stanford in 1973. Uh, Nixon had just gone to China and seen an appendectomy done with acupuncture. And so the, the idea was coming on. And then, you know, you know where it is now. He's, it's all over the place. I, I love it. I get it for so many things. It's such a healing modality. And yeah, it's great. You, said, you know, many people are watching this and saying, but I don't know how to find what it is I love. For example, Jennifer has posted um, the same thing. How, how do I find out what that is? If, how, what if it isn't easy to figure out? How can we find what we love individually? Start asking yourself. Start paying attention, attention to your dreams. Start thinking about what it is that makes your heart sing. Start asking yourself, you know, what am I here for? If you haven't asked that question, if you've never thought about it, you won't know. You know, if you're always looking for what's the, the uh, things wrong in your life, you'll find the things wrong in your life. If you, if you start looking for the things that are going right and make your heart sing and, and bring light and, and a life into your, ho into your home and your life, Pay attention to those, but do pay attention to your dreams. Ask your dreams. Ask yourself. You know, you just haven't found it yet. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Kelly Turner, who wrote the books Radical Recovery and Radical Hope, where she studied 15,000 cases of spontaneous remission of people that had very serious cancers, but they recovered. And one of the things she found as a consistent uh, commonality was they all had a strong reason to live. Yeah. 
you have to have a reason to live. You're not <laughs> it ain't towards the tr trial, you know. Otherwise, you get stuck. And if you're stuck, life can't live. Life has to move. It's one of the, of the second secret in my se series. Life has to move. If it gets stuck, it dies. Well, life has to move, but people have to move too, right? Well, how is going life move if you're not moving? I mean, we're a unit. So if you're just sitting, even if you're sitting and watching TV, your eyes are moving. So you have to keep moving. If you're alive, something is moving in, in your heart is moving, your blood is circulating, your brain is, you're hearing, you know, there's something moving, but you're not, if you're not paying attention to it, you don't even know it. You just think it's, yeah, you know, well, yeah, that's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you, do, do you remember Jack LaLanne? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was one of my heroes. And I've had his wife, Elaine, on the show several times, actually just this year for her 97th birthday. And she talks about one of the secrets to her longevity is moving. You know, even at 97, she's lifting weights. And, that, that you know, because we have a very sedentary society now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I walk 3,800 steps a day with my walker because my eyesight doesn't let me go without it. So, and I have a tricycle, which I can't ride right now because it's too hot in Arizona, but. <clears throat> Did you always, were you always active? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I couldn't sit still. Uh, I still get into trouble. My hands get me into trouble. I keep, I knit all the time because I have to keep my hands busy. Yep. That's fantastic. Let's see. Um, Cindy says, did Dr. Edgar Casey influence you and your husband's work? Oh, yes. The and how so? How so she would like Edgar to know. Casey work was pivotal to our getting a glimpse of what, um, <clears throat> what we could, how and what we could do as far as reaching our inner knowing about ourselves because we began to pay attention to meditation and, and to dreams and um, <clears throat> just the whole philosophy of life as a continuum, which included reincarnation and all of that. <clears throat> You'd like to know, would you change any of the recommendations that you learned? That what? That you learned, any of the recommendations maybe that you no, learned? Would I? Uh, when I was in medical school, birthing was really, uh, it, it was, well, I gave my birth to my first two sons using what we were calling twilight sleep. And that was an anesthetic. We put the patient, the mother, totally out of it. I mean, she, I did not know that my, that I had birthed a son for 12, for 24 hours after the baby was born because I was so anesthetized. And we were so anesthetized that the only way of birthing the baby was with forceps. So <clears throat> I learned how to use forceps and I was very good at it. I could help to deliver an after coming head. When I began to learn something more about what birth was all about and realized what we were doing, I felt <clears throat> a lot of guilt and shame for that until I realized that if I hadn't been there, the baby could not have been born. So it wasn't my fault. And therefore, I was not guilty of having birthed the babies, they at least got their life because I was there to help them be born. But we still got stuck to the idea that the only way a baby can be born is to be delivered. If you're delivered, we deliver pizzas, we deliver um, speeches, we don't deliver babies. 
women birth babies. And it's time we reclaimed that basic internal knowledge that we have that we're the ones that birth the babies. Now, sometimes we need help. And when we need help, we better get it. It's very good and it's a good thing. <clears throat> but to think that every baby that is born has to be taken because the mother can't do her job, which is our birth basic feminine female thing that we can do is to birth our babies. But we've forgotten that, like we've forgotten who we are. Well, you birthed six of them. Uh-huh. And I'm, many many of them became doctors, didn't they? Yep, there are four that are doctors. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 I've got grandkids and and I've got uh, a three-year-old grandson who has let his parents know that he was he's a doctor and he already is in preschool and all that, you know. <clears throat> That's 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 incredible. You your parents were doctors. Your husband was a doctor. That's yeah. Incredible. You know some some families are teachers. Some singers. Some people. You come into a family where you are you're recognized, and they recognize who you are because that's what this family does. You know, at 102, you seem healthier than a lot of people I know, even in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. So do you attribute that to your healthy lifestyle all these years, or, or, or genetics, or both? I, I have work to do. <laughs> so if I'm healthy, it's because I have to be strong enough. I, my, the way I figure my job right now is to keep my body healthy enough to keep my life force going and my not mind clear enough to answer the questions and do the things that both I'm asking myself and people are asking me. Here's a question from a live viewer. Did you ever util utilize hypnosis in your medical practice? Oh boy. <laughs> Milton Erickson was a good friend of ours. <clears throat> He's <laughs> the one that really um, put hypnosis on the on this picture, and that started in our living room. Uh, so, yes, I used hypnosis with pregnancy. Um, I've recommended it to lots of patients. You know, it's it's an excellent tool. And Milton Erickson's work has just been awesome. You've met a lot of famous people, including Gandhi. And I, after you tell me about what he was like, I'll tell you how I have a connection to him as well. <laughs> I was 10 years old. We were, the family was moving from India to the United States for a year and a half furlough. And we were on the train going through station after station. <clears throat> we came to this one station and the train started slowing down. And I was sitting at the window of the train in the compartment with my face plastered against the window because there were a huge crowd outside. Of course, which is nothing in India. There are huge crowds. <clears throat> but this one was chanting something and there was a man walking in front of the gr group a small man dressed in a dhoti and carrying a lot of tea and um, he just walking along and and he came right up to where in line with my window not at my window but line with my window where my face was as a 10 year old against the window and he at that point reached down to pick it to take a flower from a little girl and when he stood up his eyes met my eyes and I knew something happened I didn't know what it was nobody could ever tell me I can't tell anybody because it's not something you can put into words 
but I knew about love when he did that. It was something like, this man loves these people. This man, this is, this is true love. Well, it was so strong within me that actually 30 years later, when India partition happened and the Hindus were killing the Mohammedans, the Mohammedans killing men, it was a horrible, horrible time. But my parents had a little medical unit in their Jeep and they were going around helping the people in the, in the camps and so on. And my dad would get, he would join Gandhi on this platform, talking to the patient, to the people in the crowds, trying to get them to understand, to stop, you know, just working together. Enough so that my parents became, and Gandhi became good friends. Gandhi gave my mother a, a, a Kashmiri shawl, which I have in my closet right here. And he gave my dad a funny putt jacket. No, was, they were exchanging gifts. And I realized that <clears throat> the love that he was sharing with me was the love that my parents had been sharing with the Indian people also. And it was that kind of a deep uh, connection that, that never was broken. It was... It was there once it was connected and it was never broken. That is so cool. So let me tell you how I'm connected to yeah. Gandhi. I never met him, but I've been a vegan for almost 50 years. And there is something called the Vegetarian Hall of Fame. And I was recently inducted into it and he was inducted into it a long time ago. So that's that's my connection to Gandhi. <laughs> but I, would have, I would have loved to have met him. Oh, you know, there's somebody that's watching live that that seems to know you. Let me read the, the statement. Uh, Carol says, many years ago, I worked at the ARE clinic. Dr. Gladys and Dr. Bill were running the organization. I worked as a massage therapist, and it was a highlight of my life being part of what they put together. I sent her so much love, and she still rocks. Oh, Carol. How lovely. That's How so lovely. cool. You know, I noticed. After you know, all these years, you know, that's. That's the way life works. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you're becoming a big star, Dr. Gladys. I notice you don't wear glasses. Uh, do you, how's your do. vision? Oh, you do wear glasses. Okay. I, oh, that's beautiful. That thing you have, my grandmother always had that where you put it on your thing. Yeah. Well, I used to hang it on, on a chain around my neck. But one day I was doing a lecture and I picked my glasses up to see what I was reading. And there was a hunk of food on one of the classes. <laughs> you can't do this to the audience, you know. So That's I figured I had to do something else. So I have this, but you have to pin it to your bra. Yeah. Oh, my it's God. Saggy. Have you ever had to have cataract surgeries? Yes. Yeah. That's, That's an, an, ophthalmologist. an ophthalmologist. <clears throat> That's pretty much, wouldn't you say, a normal consequence of aging, that if everyone lives long enough, they'll probably need it, you think? Yeah. yeah. I also have glaucoma. So... You know, these are issues. They come and go. I can't see like I used to be able to see. So, so, so my sight may be defective, but my insight has, has not been damaged. Amazing. So I'm guessing you don't drive any longer. <laughs> no, I don't. Drive. How long ago did you give that up? In my 90s. I was late 90s. 90s. Um, so one of the live viewers are saying, what was the topic of your TED talk? And would you consider doing another? And if so, what would that topic be? I don't know. I mean, I know what I did for the TED talk, but I don't know what the next one would be. It would be, it would be, it would be what would seem important at the time. And, you know, you asked me about the, that when I stopped driving, I was still driving when I had my 99th birthday and I had just come down from that birthday party and, and was going to the Safeway and I had things in my uh, basket and I took, or took them out to my car and I was just reaching down to move them from the basket into the car when an older gentleman came by and he says, oh, may I help you? And I said, no, no, I can do this. 
And he, he pulls himself up straight and he says, well, I'm 86 years old. And I somehow that pushed a button in me and I pushed up my shoulders and I said, and I'm 99. And I marched off into put the things in my car and sat down in the seat and thought, you nasty old lady, what a terrible thing to do. He was just trying to be kind. I'm, I'm really getting <laughs> yes. you're a little you're a little you're a little up a hard time. And then I got to laughing. I got I realized, I finally realized that's a comedy scene two kids of the kindergarten fighting about who's the biggest or something like that. I mean, I had, and I sat there and I laughed until I couldn't even start the car. I just had to sit there and stop laughing. It was so funny. <laughs> You're a feisty one, aren't you? Well, I was going to go in and, and apologize to him. And then I finally realized, no, that's just silly. Let him figure out what to do with that one. Cause I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. How do you celebrate your birthday? Because I can I can't imagine blowing out 102 candles can't be easy. No, uh, but my 99, uh, we had a family uh, and the cake was had 99 candles in it. And when I blew that out, it set off the uh, um, <laughs> Fire alarm. <laughs> it's got off the smoke alarm. That's a little, you know you're getting old when you're thin. <laughs> yeah. That is something. So I've been posting the link both in the chat and the show notes for your book, The Well-Loved Life, 102-Year-Old Doctor, Six Secrets to Health and Happiness at Every Age. What prompted you to write that book? And I, I got to say, I'm glad that I got it on Audible because I loved hearing your voice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I had written bo books, but all of them were based in medicine. But there was something that was made that I needed to say beyond what I could say as a medical doctor. You know, not just it was it was something that had more the heart of medicine than uh, just the acts and, and so on. So that's what this book's about. And it took a long time because, and, and uh, help from people that I worked with and loved and all this, you know, it's 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 taken a lifetime to gather the stories and and put them together in a way that uh, hopefully helps people understand themselves. Yeah. Well, you talk a lot about your personal story, and uh, you're you're a cancer survivor. Uh-huh. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because people are saying, do you recommend mammograms and things like that? Well, it depends on who you are and in time. The way I <clears throat> worked with the cancer in the uh what was it? Yeah, which types I believe you had thyroid and breast, is that correct? Yeah. And when how long ago was thyroid that? Thyroid was in the 60s. And uh, I went through a 30-day fast. And <laughs> I, Do you mean like a water fast or a juice fast? Uh, well, a little bit of, of grape juice, but that was all, and water. And lost, I think, 30 pounds. And the tumor went away, but I had some poultices that I was doing and so on. So I was doing a very uh, <clears throat> intensive, uh, holistic reach for the getting rid of the cancer but when I so I did you know and but when it came along this time and I was in my 90s and it was in the breast and technology had advanced so far that removing that cancer from my breast was a simple act of surgery and a little bit of radiation but <clears throat> it, to me, it was life. I, see, if I had had to have had a, a breast removed or a lump removed when I had the thyroid cancer, I couldn't have done that because what we were doing oh my, for breast cancer in 
those years was removal of all of the tissue down to the bare basis and then radiate. And so we were destroying all kinds of tissue. It was barbaric. <clears throat> it was really bad. I hated breast surgery in those, those days because it was so damaging. <clears throat> but when I had the thyroid, <coughs> I thought, well, you cut your toenails and you cut your hair. It's not serving you anymore. This isn't serving you anymore. Get it out. Yeah, that's amazing. I because I used to work at a place in Santa Rosa in its med with MDs medically supervised water fasting, where they fast patients on nothing but water for up to 40 days and have reversed all kinds of diseases from autoimmune diseases to diabetes to cancer. And that's incredible. You knew about this 60 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you require hearing aids or any assisted? devices like a walker or I have glasses I walk with a walker I try to get 3800 steps in a day yeah I I not only recognize those aids uh, I am so grateful to have them and then I have my children and they've been wonderful helping me right now two of my sons are here one is going to go back to austin tomorrow but <clears throat> we help with her technology but she lives <laughs> upstairs yeah she goes <laughs> up and down the stairs every day multiple times by herself <laughs> I hear that from, I, I had a 106 year, when I used to have a television show, I had a 106 year old doctor on and he said, one of the secrets was walking up and down steps. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are, is your family in good health? I, I, your, I, I don't want to be rude and ask your sons how old they are, but I'm guessing if you're 102, they must be. Well, during the code, the, the, I told them that they were the elderly. I was an ancient one. <laughs> <laughs> are they, is your family as healthy as you are? Yeah, they're good. They're, you know, they have their ups and downs. They're, they're good. Mona's saying if we can see your children, I don't know if they want to come on camera. They're welcome to. Oh, they're they're, they're these two, my two sons, number, number two and number four. John's downstairs actually oh, right now. It's just me. He's, he's, so this yeah. is, and these two, this one, when he was four, he came into the living room one day and he says, mama, I know something. And I says, what's that, Bobby? He says, if I make a friend and he makes a friend and he makes a friend, it's going to go all around the world and come back to me. Of course, he's a psychologist. Okay. <laughs> and the one that's downstairs is a retired Presbyterian minister. But when he was seven, he came into the house and he says, I wish Jesus was here. And I <laughs> said, well, I do too, but why you? And he says, because I have questions. Aww. And he says, and I says, well, ask me, maybe I can help you. He says, you don't have the answers. And I says, well, try me. So he says, okay. How can God be if he never got started? <laughs> so I take a big, deep and swallow. And I say, well, maybe it's like a circle. It has no beginning or end he says i know you didn't have the answers and off he went <laughs> it seems like you your family has a history of knowing what they want to be when they grow up at very young ages isn't that the truth my my daughter is that my youngest daughter who was my we were partners and after well anyway um when she was little and her dad was a doctor and i was a doctor she comes up to me and up to us she she was standing in front of us and she was about three two or three and she looks up and she says last time when i was a doctor i was a daddy doctor not a mommy doctor <laughs> and i says well ooh la la <laughs> you're spunky susanna wants to know if your children are proud of you i guess that your son can answer that he's right there um proud is a small word for what we feel we're, we're thrilled, delighted, awe-inspired by her. <laughs> and and I, I want to clarify, yes, most of them know what they wanted to be when they were like two. Yeah. Not me. 
No. Uh, and it's frankly freaking and intimidating sometimes <laughs> to, to have that. And it, uh, uh, Peter Drucker, uh, who was big in organizational development, said, here I am 40 and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. That was kind of like me. Uh, it took me a while, but um, but it is, um, but that's because what I wanted was pretty unique. So it took a while to find the, the places in the puzzle to fit in so that I could learn that much about myself. One other thing I wanted to say, Carol, I may have met you when I was working at the ARE clinic, uh, possibly. So that's so Get cool. With, with mom and say hi. Dr. Gladys, nice to meet you, by the way. Thank you for popping on. Dr. Gladys, do you remember the first president you voted for? Uh, well, it would have been uh, during the World War. I, I no, I no, I must have voted for somebody in when I was came to college. <laughs> I don't, uh, Hmm. That's okay. If you remember, let me know. That was, that, that was a tough question. Do you have any pets or did you have pets? Because I feel that yeah. one of the most healing things in life was being in nature and with animals. We always had pets when the children were little. We had big Samoyeds. They were great, big, white, fluffy dogs. And <clears throat> when I was in my house here, before I went to Afghanistan, I had Princess, a big, fluffy cat, but she left when I left <laughs> and so I haven't had a cat a pet here but my daughter who lives in the big house in front has had a big black cat for but he just died a couple of years ago anyway you know there's all there's been something living and in this in our house all the time and when we were growing up we, we had wonderful hunting dogs black labs that's wonderful well, you mentioned afghanistan you might just mention when you went over there how old you were yeah i was 86 when i went to afghanistan um, my brother carl taylor started uh human no you've got the human potential he, <laughs> future generations and he'd been working with the afghani women and found out that the death rate was highest in maternal death rates uh, in Afghanistan, any place in the world. And they couldn't get any answers because they couldn't, they weren't allowed to talk to the women and so on. So he suggested that if I could uh, come over and spend some time, maybe we could work out something. Well, I was getting ready to retire anyway. So, um, I went over and spent time. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. The things that we learned, and it helped. Uh, it helped. When did you uh, stop practicing medicine? How old were you? Uh, 86, I guess, when I went to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But I'm still consulting, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it life consultations. So could people ostensibly contact you for a session if they wanted to? They can see if, if I can fit it I, you know, I, I, now with these podcasts going around. I know. So what do you think about all this, Dr. Gladys? Do you enjoy doing Instagram lives and YouTube lives like this? Do you, do you enjoy the public speaking and being out there? It blows my mind. I absolutely try to put my mind around what it is that uh, that I'm being asked to do, and I'm so grateful to do. And the people that I'm meeting, like you, you know, I'm getting to meet people face to face from all over the world. They one, to, one day, I had three people from different parts of India who had called in. I've had them from, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, Paris and Aust London and Ireland, Australia. And Australia. I mean, they're just calling from all over. I I just have to, I feel, finally figured out my job is to keep my body healthy and my mind clear because life is just going so fast and so far that uh, 
even try to um, put it into context is, is very, very difficult. You know, I know you can't see the chat from where you're sitting. You can look at it afterwards, but so many people are saying you're such an inspiration and that compared to you, we all feel like slackers. <laughs> no, don't feel like slackers. Just keep moving and find your juice because, you know, here's what I figured out. When God, whatever God is to each one of us, when God created the earth, it was beautiful. I mean, he had done everything beautiful. It was just gorgeous, a wonderful world. And then he created the human being. And he said to us as humans, now, see all this beautiful stuff. And so I now give you are the only people, the only living things on the earth who have free choice and free will. I therefore give you dominion over the world. And we in our arrogance thought he said dominance. And so we therefore shucked our shoulders back and said, okay, we can do anything we want to with this earth. And that's pretty much what we've done. And mother earth is now letting us know that she doesn't like it very well. And so, I, I think that when E.T. was pointing at going home, you know, he's reaching for home. I think an awful lot of us are doing that now. We're reaching for our true humanity. We know it's there. We know why we feel we, the things that we feel. We know we, we can feel the inner juice within us. Well, that's the true humanity. And, and I think we're beginning to waken up to it. talking to people like you, talking to people to your audience and realizing that, no, we're not just uh, puppets. We have choice and we have will. And it's our job to do the things that will create help and for ourselves and for others and for the world. You know, you you seem sharp as a tack. You don't seem to have any type of cognitive decline whatsoever to me. <laughs> so that I think that's a big secret because a lot of people are living longer, but not necessarily living better. They they need to look for what they can live to reach for. You know, that they, they don't know that 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 they can do that. People haven't told them. They, you know, they've told them, you know, when you get to be in fact, my son is downstairs, you didn't see him, but the one he went to see his doctor uh, about a year ago, who started identifying to him the things that are in the process of starting to probably maybe go wrong in his body. <laughs> you know, in other words, the medical idea is that you get to be in the 70s and all of these things are going to go wrong. So you better start to get ready for what's going to go wrong. Well, I don't think so. That's amazing. I think I heard you mention on one of the podcasts I listened to that you had stem cell treatments or stem cell infusions. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about that. Is that something you would recommend? And if so, for what? Well, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, I was uh, really pleased that what uh, they have done for me is that they've helped my right eye. I wasn't able to see uh, colors at all until after I had my stem cells. And now I can see colors through my right eye. Uh, so there are different parts of the body that have gotten kind of worn out <laughs> and tired at 102. And so I figured there these stem cells are available now. Let's see what we can do. See what they can. And I think they've helped me with, with my stamina. Uh, certainly, you know, I can't complain. She's always been on the um, forefront of trying things out whatever they were, and that's one. 
That's very, very cool. So here's the million dollar question. And it took us a while to get to it. And everybody wants to know, I know the answer because I listened to your book and you say that everyone's different. What does Dr. Gladys eat? And are there certain foods that are best for us to avoid if we want to live to 102? Find out what they are for you because they're not, they're not the same for everybody. I have a son who can't eat garlic. The rest of us love garlic, but you don't want to be around my son as he's eating garlic. You know, it's uh, it, it the garlic isn't good for him. Um, you know, I I have used well. I grew up in India, so Indian food is wonderful. But I I eat what I have served to me right now basically, in that I have raisin bran and prunes for breakfast, you know, so that's been working for me for a long, long time, and I continue with that, and I use lactose-free milk, but, you know, find what works for you. I mean, what works for me may not be the right thing for you at all, and yet something that I, try to make it as fresh and live and uh, something that is interesting to you. I love salads. I eat, try to eat a salad every day, a fresh salad, but I like soups and I like, I like food, you know, I, uh, and I actually do like cake too. <laughs> how, how often do you eat it? Oh, not often. But if we have a birthday, I eat the cake. And I, I like chocolate. I like a chocolate piece now and then. I mean, these are things that I like and, and I, I allow myself to have them. Would you say, though, that since you were born, a large part of your diet has been fresh things like fruits and vegetables? Oh, yeah, mostly. Yeah. What do you think about alcohol? I, I don't like the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to tell a story, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. When I was growing up, she would um, uh, juice, carrot juice, like very often. I guess it was every day. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I know we when would I take. Was preg pregnant, it was Helene, yeah. it was every day. So we would take the uh, remains and, you know, the, the, the carrot pulp and throw it outside in the garden and then more carrot juice. So there was so much carrot juice in our family that I was able to go to the playground in, I guess, third grade and show off my orange palms. And it's so cool. Every, nobody else had orange palms, but I had orange palms because of all carotene. It was really neat. So thank you, Mom. That is so funny. Dr. Gladys, of all your great accomplishments, is there one that you're particularly the most proud of? Well, I'm certainly proud of my family. I mean, I'm I'm so grateful for them. But I, I, I don't think it, it's, you know, it's, it's not so much that I'm proud of this. I'm so grateful to be able to do the medical stuff that I've been able to do. So it's more a feeling of, of gratitude and, and um, accomplishment, yes, and grateful. But I'm so grateful that I've been able to do it because that's what gives me my juice. Hmm. Is there anything you haven't accomplished that you're looking forward to? Jumping out of oh, a plane. My 10-year plan. Yeah. Have you ever done anything like jump out of a plane or something like that? No, but I did ride a tricycle in for my 90th. No, which birthday was this? And her third birthday. Nice. Susanna, who's watching live, says, does Dr. Gladys have any words of encouragement or suggestions for those of us dealing with elderly parents who are unhealthy and depressed and not interested in changing their ways? That's a tough one, because I have two people that are close to me that are that way, wake up in the morning and say, oh, on another day, you know, they just drag themselves through it. And they've I've known, they've known me and I've known them and they've heard my talks and they've learned some of them, you know, one of them has read my books. You can't, you can 
keep on, keep on, keep on. And I, that's what I'm doing. Every chance I get, I try to uh, give them something that they, would be hope. But it's like the, the fifth L, you know, listening. If you're not wanting to listen, it you don't hear it. It's a clanging gong, and it's, uh, and they they are really um, hanging on to their pain and the darkness because they haven't wanted to turn around and look at the light. And um, so I'm going to keep on suggesting, and uh, hopefully, somewhere along the line. Before they make the transition, they'll be able to find out that their lives have been great. Because, you know, this one uh, friend, well, she's a relative, really, has four wonderful, wonderful children. And uh, if nothing else, she could glory in what those children are doing. But... Um, uh, it's not, she hasn't got understood that yet. And uh, so it, it's very sad if you, that you can't make people do what, what you want them to do. No, don't you wish that was the, I wish I could do that. <laughs> that would be my superpower. You know, I hear that there's two types of people, Dr. Gladys, one that wakes up and says, good morning, God. And the other one that wakes up and says, good God morning. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, uh, Aaron is saying, what a beautiful woman. I love her hair and the lace work that goes around her dress and collar. What do you do for fun now, Dr. Gladys? Well, let me tell you, I, I in medical school, I crocheted this because I could do it under the desk and the teacher didn't have to see that. And because I did stuff like this, the dean sent me to the psychiatrist twice. <laughs> she thought I you know, yeah, okay. The psychiatrist said it was I. I could go back to medical school. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious! So, what do you do for fun? Do you do you watch television, Netflix? Do you read? I, uh, well, uh, I knit because I knit these little wash cloths that I give to everybody. So, and um, I do audio books. They have been wonderful, aren't they? Great, even if you have great sight, it's just it's. I love the experience of listening. Right, right. Yeah. So, that, did you, you know, listen to your own book? Did you listen to your own book on Audible? I love. We listened to a little bit of it, didn't we, John? But <laughs> it's good, especially the parts where you're talking. I think are fabulous. Yeah. Even though you're saying that people have to find what works for them, would you agree that maybe there's certain foods that people should either minimize or avoid, like heavily processed foods, things like that? That yeah, well, they the processed foods and. And not too much pork. I mean, I suppose uh, a little bacon now and then is okay, but I I don't think pork is, well, for some people it works, but for a lot of people it doesn't. And um, meat, there are some people who really should eat them. I had a friend who was a vegan and she, she was so anemic, I really, really had to talk her into started to eat some meat you know her body was not processing the feed the food that she was putting in so that they were creating cell so you know it depends on on the individual but it really is the fresher you can have the food the, um and 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 find out what works for you it's it really is a personal job Absolutely. Yeah. But I'm sure when you were born, I believe in 1920, a lot of the stuff that's around now wasn't even invented. Back no, then. no, no. What's been the greatest change you've seen either in medicine or the world? Well, uh, the greatest change, I, I think it's the technology. I think the technology, look at what we're doing. Yeah, You're, isn't that something? Can you believe this social yeah, media? It's, it's crazy, cool. isn't it? Yeah. And it's that kind of things that they're happening all around the world. They're amazing. And the things that are happening in the field of medicine, that, that uh, the stem cells, think about that. You know, there, I, 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 I'm just in awe with life. 
Yeah, that's amazing. You're very inspiring. Alicia says, do you do anything intentionally to make new neural pathways, like learning a new language or playing a musical instrument? Uh, no. Do you play a musical instrument? No. But well, I, have, I think but it's time to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I have hymns that run through my head all the time. And <clears throat> and what you're doing right now is certainly cognitively invigorating. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. Thank you so much. Do That's you, Bob. Do you, uh, do you speak any other languages? Well, Hindustani. And I did learn German in college. But my German teacher in high school was, was one of Hitler's plants, and she was trying to, to get it. I can't even get into all of that, but uh, that was in 1930, whatever, 34, 37, 36. I'm wondering, being 102, you probably don't have very many friends your age. No, but I've sure got a lot of nice younger ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll probably outlive them all. You, you've just been so fun to talk to. I think I'm going to ask you one more question that I've asked many of the people that I've interviewed that are 90 and up. Well, actually, no, there's one that just showed up in the chat that I'm going to have to ask. So I'm going to ask that first. And then my closing question, and it's, what is your biggest piece of advice for young people? Layla wants to know. Stretch your self to find yourself. Stretch you yourself. find yourself, you're going to be so happy. Uh, yeah, you, I guess you're going to have to keep making new friends, huh? Uh huh. So here's my question. There was a movie that was a, a long time ago. It was a movie, a subtitled movie from Japan called Afterlife. And the premise of the movie was that when we die, we go to this like way station where we literally have to watch a video of our whole life. And before we can transcend to the afterlife, each person in the movie had to pick one memory from their life to move forward. And the people that were stuck in the way station, they couldn't choose. And I know it's going to be really hard for you after 100 years, but it, it, if you could only pick one memory for your life, what would you pick? This moment. Wow, that's profound. <laughs> You are, you're no, you're 102, yet you're still wise beyond your years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you so much for coming on my show. It's really been an honor, a, a privilege, and a pleasure. And if you're free on November 30th, I'd love you to come back because I've never had a 103 year old on my show. <laughs> I'm just curious. I know you said you like salad. Um, do you ever put balsamic vinegar on your salad? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just that every guest on Chef AJ Live, the first time they come on, gets two free bottles of California balsamic vinegar in the flavor of their choice. And they even it even comes in chocolate. So I'm going to send you an email and hopefully you'll find two that you like. Everyone's okay. saying they've uh, you've only only already been here and they already would love to see you again. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm recommending people follow you on Instagram. I put both links. You seem to have two pages, the link to your book. It's a wonderful listen. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your work. And you really are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when my guest is Dr. Kelly Casperson, and we'll be discussing her book, You Are Not Broken. Take care.